Greetings ladies and mental gents and welcome to my channel, where I like to make audio narrations of stories from across the internet. In this series, we'll be focusing on a web novel called There Is No Epic Lucha, Only Puns, from the website Royal Road. And in this video, we'll be doing chapter 73.5 to 75. I hope that you enjoy. There is no epic lucha, only puns, chapter 73.5. Interlude, spoiled for choice. It was almost too much for Surma, escorted to the giant building shaped like a coliseum with a red domed roof made of some exotic metal. She watched as the streets were cleared away by Zane and he simply kept a sedate pace. People moved when a royal knight walked. They were sworn to protect the royal family. The kindness need not extend to the public. Soma knew that they couldn't kill, but she reminded herself that people who returned from the abyss of the royal dungeon had more than simple power under their belts. Even Zane. Especially Zane. Keeping her eyes up, Soma watched as all the small shops and twisty side streets passed by. Soma tried to be positive. No matter how her father or mother blustered or demanded solutions, the dungeon's words were clear. Soma was to reach the 10th floor with the Bronze Star Adventurer. Rank 3 at the best. Orders to slip royal knights in as disguised warriors were shut down as well by the head priest. The dungeon would be watched for refinement. Soma looked skyward as her lessons came back as words. Being a princess of the capital meant her education was important, as a benefit and a requirement. Manner refinement was a term used by the world at large to refer to someone whose manner became potent and strong by constantly using or training their combat, magic and or rare skills in dungeon space. She adjusted her braid slightly as she avoided the public's strange gaze. Soma had insisted on walking to get into the spirit of things. She kind of regretted it now. Having three royal knights making the way to an awkward blank space between her and the people of the kingdom. Sure, assassins would always be waiting, but Soma just felt like an exotic creature to be stared at now. She was close to the girl building, so she kept her eyes averted. It was almost impossible to fake untested or raw, unrefined manner that was unrefined. The best tactic was to simply use manner around people. But the dungeon would know. It was a god unto its own realm, and trying to trick it was unwise. A new dungeon, or a common one, may be somewhat confused, or even manipulated, but one as old as her kingdoms. It was asking for Soma's name to be stricken from the books of history if the dungeon caused a calamity. Soma was sure that even her father managed to negotiate a proper contract with a fair play and used his own army. The royal dungeon would not be so easily held to its current form. Its awareness had evolved into a bored intelligence. If it were to be pushed to a breaking point by the kingdom holding its floors hostage, Soma felt that her heart go cold at the thought. The idea of the level 100 boss monster breaking out and... Breathe. Wilder urged quietly, her features so often accused of being cut from a beautiful stone, watched her for a moment. We shall not leave you in the hands of louts or thugs. She promised, and the sight of having her spear on the ground made the chill retreat from Surma's chest. Thank you. She said and smiled back. Brother merely nodded. The slight tone change and the tapping spear letting Surma know the woman was pleased. Brother did not open up to people nor explain herself. Surma had learned to understand Brother the way one learns to predict storms on the sea or to change on mountains. With great patience and fear, then love. If there was one royal knight that Soma would say fit the title, it was her guardian since childhood, Brolder. It wasn't to say Gionha or even Liera were as a slouch, but Brolder had such a grace that she hadn't seen since the only other royal knight that read her a bedtime story. Soma felt a twinge of pain as she thought of why. She broke out of her thoughts as the doors were loudly pushed open by Zane his appearance silencing the chaotic, cheerful noise coming from within. Soma pressed her hands tight against her waist. Her royal white dress was adorned, golden tiara was only offset by the out-of-place green bead bracelet on her arm. Her good luck charm. Soma felt that she would truly need it today. 
The guild hall's main entrance was a large, wooden, double-doored affair that was more of a cheerful and red. Above the door was a sign as if there was imitating many dungeons and patrons inside would have visited the place. It was cocky when they named it and the place all those years ago. Her father had muse once, but now everyone knew what each other meant when they said that they were going to the usual place or the place to be. It was annoyingly relevant in the city. She walked in with Brilda at her side. It was hard to disguise how Soma craned her neck in wide sweeps, trying to take it all in like she was one of those tourist folks that wandered into the city. It was almost like a ghost of her mother's hand on her back was real as Soma corrected her posture and retained her regal, pleasant, but distant expression. In the inside of the building, the main hall, from what Soma could see, followed more of a red and gold theme the building promised from the outside. Soma actually felt like the place was a bit too much. Ironic, coming from a princess who ate with gold and walked on gems, but Soma felt odd that a gathering place of rough and tough strudel seekers was more akin to a hotel entrance. A large section of the room was dedicated to the open fireplace, sofas, chairs, stools, and a bar near the corner. The prices Soma noticed were far higher than the local businesses. As someone who had forced to study the economics of imported grapes, barrels, ale, and peanuts for two weeks until she could recite it backwards, Soma knew that the alcohol they served was both overpriced and weird. The common drinks were a thief in a bottle, but there were drinks Soma had never heard of. Devil's Bum, Liquid Courage and Wisdom, Folio's Brew, and Dragon Spit. Did this place have uh, an alchemist, a spirit alchemist? Not to be confused with a necromancer who became an alcoholic, but an actual master of the wines and spirits of the world. Soma had heard these things that they were made so delicious and powerful that one sip of the ripe brew could make a mouse turn into a hero. Soma blinked and then smiled slowly to herself. A mouse hero? That would be slightly delightful and adorable. Soma doubted that this place had one, but she couldn't help but check the bar for a tiny mouse door that would lead to some secret league of mice and swords and stars. It would be called the League of Little Heroes. Soma was almost washed away into the lands of fantasy as she imagined them riding on frogs and rabbits before Brilda cleared her throat and guided her towards the stairs and, once on the second floor, to a door that was guarded by two men in armor that gave off uh, adequate power. Soma felt sort of bad. Growing up in the royal knights had dulled her respect for the levels of manner refinement that didn't make one fear for one's life. Inside the room were many nice sofas and a window that had a wonderful view of a fair city. Valuran, how Soma had only ever seen it was best features. Now, even from the guest room, Soma spotted cracks, nooks. People walked around in clothes that didn't cost the same as a small field. It was refreshing and a little scary. Me and the Spear Witch will go talk to the Guildmaster, see which sorry wretch we can find in this place that won't get you killed. Zane announced, Summer blinked and eyed the room that was clearly for her, uh, waiting. Yep, stay and don't die. Lorsa will be doing whatever Lorsa does. Zane added dryly. Summa turned to see the empty room suddenly filled by the third royal knight and her entourage. Lorsa. The person in such a heavy cloak that all details were guesses at best. Lorsa had not been in the room a moment ago, and Soma was talking to Zane, who blocked the only door in or out. Doing what I do best, Lorsa agreed. Soma tried to at least look politely assured to have a god, but she might have failed. Lorsa was in a group of knights that Soma had dubbed the Weird Ones. Really, the royal knights only had three subgroups to understand. The straightforward, scary ones. Rolda and Zane would belong to this. The weird ones that had joined freaking people out, then had abilities not fit for public spa. Then there were the ones that were off. Nothing quite looked wrong, nor did anything stand out. But being near one of those nights made good people and creatures flee and the light dim. Just a little. These were the ones that her father had on a very short leash, or as far away as possible. All for the best, Summer thought. Lorsa was hardly the worst. 
Brolda carefully reached out and brushed Soma's single loose lock of hair back behind her ear. Won't be long, Zane reminded and walked off. Brolda at his heels, more to make sure that he didn't divert to the bar than following in line. The door closed and Soma turned to speak to Lorsa, but the cloaked figure was gone, vanishing as fast as they had peered. Oh, I do not like that, she warned the empty room. Maybe empty? Lorsa was a weirdo, but at least they didn't act like a creep or scare her by appearing out of nowhere. It just made her uneasy to be unsure whether she really was alone or not. That feeling was quickly overtaken by annoyance as she sat with a proper posture on the plush sofa, facing the fire that had more fire stones in it than was strictly needed. This was Surma's task, should she not be there at the table, viewing her potential warriors with her own eyes. Was she expected to walk into a danger with strangers? Surma watched the fire burn without tinder and the stone fireplace. Yes, yes you are. The best of the best that are available will be chosen, and I will accept them with grace. This is about more than yourself, she reminded herself sharply. She sat straight and placed her hand into her lap. Her only breaking of proper appearance was a single finger fidgeting with the green bracelet. If she failed, then the dungeon wouldn't force the punishment that he had warned about. The prince of the dungeon's warnings words not to be trifled with. Summer swallowed hard and nodded. Summer's desires would not dare to come at such a risk to the city. She would sit here and let others handle her life. As always, Shimmer blinked up slowly at the sudden tapping noise. She stared at the door for a long moment. That didn't sound like it had come from the door. Summer froze, and there it was again, a firm tapping noise growing frantic. It sounded like the noise at so many royal balls, glass being smacked against something usually another glass. Soma spun to see a hand banging on the second floor window. Staring in surprise, the sudden tapping pushed the window open and the knocker pulled himself into the room. Ow, 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 ow! My fingers feel like they got caught in Auntie Hop's cooking jar again. The young boy complained as he fanned his fingers, which indeed looked very red from uh, Soma could only guess hanging on her window ledge. Summer could call her gods or scream or develop some sudden hidden royal magic to blast this intruder to ash, but honestly, Summer was too shocked at the sudden appearance to do more than stare. Her father would sigh as his various sword lessons went to waste and her mother would join him in Summer's rudeness. The boy was younger than her, or at least very small for his age. His black hair was pulled back into a ponytail that brushed his lower back. Unlike Soma's own braid, so tightly made and decorated, this boy's hair looked more like a contained wild animal. He kept rowing on his fingers, which allowed Soma to fully take in the rest of him. He was an odd-looking thing with slightly two blue big trousers tied with a black belt. A torn white shirt that looked for overdue to be burned, and he had what appeared to be a book hanging from his belt like a handy tool by a piece of thread. Then there was the sword on his back that Surma saw as the boy turned to survey the room. It was horrid, chipped, dirty grey blade. But it had been used well. Surma's weapon master whispered in her ear in memory of their reinforced handle. The way the blade looked less damaged by ill care and more by long time use fending off deadly blows. Are you the guild master? the boy said, snapping Surma out of a stupor. The question was both unexpected and bizarre. What sort of logic would have one to assume that a girl in a dressing crowd, sitting in some waiting room, would be the guild master? Her frustration leaking just a little at having her moody thinking interrupted by some boy. Yes, clearly I am. What gave it away? She snapped. The boy sighed with relief. Right room after all. Told Zan that she was wrong. My name is Mess. I want to be a hero, he announced. He thrust his hand out and his years of inbuilt instincts took over. She nearly shook the hand and smiled as the other person was some important diplomat from some country that she couldn't pronounce. What? she replied, still wearing her best fake smile. Mass beamed. I want to join up with the guild and take on the dungeon. I tried to apply downstairs, but I was rejected. So I just thought I'd come straight to the head of the honcho and deal with you. I'm so glad that you're nice and much prettier than the bat behind the desk. 
Mass said in a just-between-us whisper, as if the bat downstairs had the hearing of one rather than just the looks. I think you have the wrong... Soma tried to explain, seeing how the sarcasm had done what her mother had always warned it would, get her into trouble. So what do I need to do? Beat goblins up, wrestle dragons, rescue a princess, Mass demanded, eyes glinting so brightly that it was slightly adorable in its own way. Soma also took offense to the last one until she remembered that she was sitting in a guild, waiting on her protectors building her a defense to save her from the dungeon dangers. Maybe you could help a princess rather than simply assume that she's useless and needs a man. She replied hotly. Mash shrugged. If you know one that needs help, I'll help. My hero book said that it always need rescuing, so I just assume that they were off being called anyway, but just ran into trouble. The boy scratched his nose. Summer stared at him with one eyebrow raised. You clearly don't know what a prince's daily schedules are. Adventure and excitement are clearly on the never-happening day. She sat down, not feeling like she had a lot to worry about from the boy now. An energetic lad, but in the end, just someone looking for a fantasy. I don't know any princesses, but if you know any, can you let them know that Mass is here to save, uh, offer them a hand? He placed his hands on his hips, making the tattered boy shake slightly. Despite her hollow mood, she couldn't help but a small smile. Noted, I'll pass on a note to any princesses. Why were you rejected? She suddenly asked, which made Mass huff. You need a recommendation thing and money, he said, looking unimpressed. Recommendation? You mean... I suppose that's not a bad, but a fee isn't unreasonable. They do give you a guild seal in return. Those things do take money to make, she pointed out. Yeah, but what if you don't have any rec... rec... Someone's word and I don't have the money. He fired back, and Soma blinked, not have money. Right, that happens to people, and Soma now felt like a stupid royal brat that had zero understanding of the world. If you show off your skills with a few unpaid kills, or work around the town, that can also be a form of recommendation. If you keep it up, the guild would see you as an asset and waive the application fee. She explained kindly, Mast waved his hands as he dropped onto the sofa next to her, slouching so much that Soma felt the lessons of her mother die in shock. I brought them all the wolf fang, snake skins, and a few goblin things, but they all just said that I shouldn't lie and took the stuff away as dangerous. I even did the tasks and wrote down the people that I helped, but they don't want to check. Waste a time, the bat said. Mast grumbled. That was... Uh, they stole your items. Zoma focused on the first thing wrong. Mass sat up, nodding furiously. They wanted my sword, but said it was going to break anyway. I worked hard, and no one cares. So I came to you because I hoped that not everyone who was an adventurer, a hero, could be bad. He trailed off, and for the first time since Mass appeared, his bright spirit dipped. They're not. Heroes are real, but what they did is wrong. Mass, I'm not a guild master. I apologize, but I was just being sarcastic due to my bad mood. She dipped her head in apology. There was a beat of silence. Oh, that makes sense, I guess. Your office looked way too boring. Mass agreed before blinking at Soma. So, who are you? He asked, leaning closer to Soma than usually experienced people being. I'm Prin... She cut off herself for a second before she smiled. Soma, a pleasure. She held out her dainty hand as her blood demanded. Instead of the practice kiss and the back of the palm, Mass shook it hard again. Soma, that's a sweet name. Sorry for busting in here and all of that, but if you're here, you must want to be a hero too. He stated the boy's brain making a truly impressive leaps in logic. Soma was about to correct him, but wasn't the fact that she was angry that she wasn't being allowed to truly experience the dungeon the whole reason that she was here? Sort of. She ended up saying, Mass looked annoyed. Must have turned you down too. Did they take your weapon? He stood, actually looking her over for the first time. You just noticed what I have on my person. Soma asked blankly, Mass grinned. I was too busy staring at your face. It's nice, he said, crossing his arms with a confidence only a boy could have. Won't royal etiquette cover this? Laughed frankly at his compliment. No, Soma actually did feel something out of compliment. Deny it with grace, 
she was sure that Mass wouldn't understand the social gameplay of a false denial. Declare war on his nation. Wouldn't that just be civil war? Call for his head. But then he couldn't keep speaking to her like a person, which Surma really enjoyed. She was trapped between royal secretive smile and utter indifference. Her baffled mind went for both and she ended up smiling with her wide eyes. The look was not being painted any time soon, but Mass laughed cheerfully as he pulled her up, her horrified mind making sure to put up no resistance. Let's go find the guildmaster, all show off our skills and get registered. Then we can team up and my friends on, and then we can take on the dungeon and I can marry a princess. Mass explained very quickly. Marry a what? Soma's mouth yelped before the mind could wrestle control back. Mass's strong grip had her out of the door before long, and while Soma did protest, she also felt better. She gathered herself as the bat at the receptionist gaped as Mash dragged the royal princess towards her. The woman was pretty, but the eyes held a gleam of something that irked Soma. Perhaps it was high time that she finally used all this prince's influence for something. Chewing a thief out in a highly respectable place would be simple. A fine place to begin, but she had to make sure to do it with such a way that Mass didn't uh, learn of her status. How he didn't know with a crown and a white gown and a VIP room, she had no idea, but she was actually having a good time for once since her birthday. Upstairs, Rosa put their cup of tea on the table in front of the sofa where Princess Surma and the boy had been sitting moments before. The cloak dropped to reveal a shocking white hair and hid a smiling face. Oh, youth, to be young again. Rosa toasted with empty hands. The princess was safe. There was nowhere she could go that Lorsa could not be in less than a second. Even then, Lorsa's watchful eye had claws and hit well. The boy was just funny, and his ability to pull the princess out of her slump was cute. Now Lorsa just had to keep delaying the guild master down the street from the guild hall another, oh, 40 minutes until the princess and the boy would pass the little test. Lorsa had a big fan of pushing the chicks out of the nest. Too often snakes devoured the scared chicks and dared not to fly. The tea was drunk in an instant and Lorsa was gone before the cup landed back on the table. It was no surprise that Mass now had a decent recommendation. A quick word had also seen that his items returned before long. Mass was in awe of Silver's apparent ability to make people do what she wanted. Are you some sort of puppet mage? Or are you using some scary fear power? He inquired. Soma rolled her eyes as they led to a small hall testing room. It's called manners and firmness, she responded. The pale receptionist gestured to a row of seats where a few other men and women sat, waiting. P -p Please wait for your names. She stuttered. Mass waved at her with a winning grin. That's right, you'll hear the name of Mass and Soma. The dynamic duo, he bragged. The woman looked to Soma with fear and alarm. She merely shook her head and walked to the seat. Only once she was resting on the hard wooden chair, almost a stool, really, did she consider what she was doing. Brulda was going to glare at her. Zane wouldn't care unless Surma really turned out to be a pain to find. Then he'd be annoyed, and that was bad for all involved. Rosa would do... something? But why was she taking the test to become a Bronze Star adventurer? I'm so excited. You're going to do awesome, Soma. Believe in yourself. Even if you don't pass, you can join my guild. He promised kindly. Soma took comfort in that. If her mother found out that she had escaped her guard and went in public without us even a disguise, she might need somewhere to run and hide. The nervous people around them merely watched as some no-name casually called Soma by her first name. They seemed to inch away from him as if Soma would set him on fire any second. But soon enough, names of the groups were called, and sometimes just single names. Soma had agreed to be on Mass's shared application, something groups could do, if the strength were in line with teamwork, like priests or mages. To be honest, this was good. Soma was actually getting to see the process in action, and if worse came to worse, one of these people could be in her group to reach the tenth floor. Seeing who came out with the defeat and who came out with smoke said a lot. 
The test took place on the other side of the simple door, and soon enough a plain man called out calmly, as if he truly had heard and seen it all. Mass and Surma of uh, Ultra Dragon Explorers? The hall was too quiet, other than Surma slowly turning neck as she stared at the already striding mass. Wow, another testy said bluntly. Not even three hundred years of noble blood could keep Surma's chin high and proud. I should have expected nothing less, she admitted to herself as they walked into the room. The plain man with the short hair and dull eyes walked over and stood at the center of the empty room. You have three minutes to land an attack on me, he stated. Surma had to remind herself that Bronze Rank 1 was basically had used a weapon once. It was not weird for such a basic test. The man hadn't looked scratched that much, so Surma did wonder how the others passed. Still, the faster this was over, the better. Hopefully before Surma was found by the irate royal knight. The only downside was that Surma lacked a blade, her preferred weapon. Massa's body was almost vibrating with anticipation. Remember, he is trained. She gave him a warning. Massa's answer was brief. As long as you've got my back, we can do this, he promised. The enthusiasm was nice. Surma would have to extract it and bottle it to cure the world of depression. Could there be another such cheerful boy in this land? Without a blade, she only had one thing. A single spell that she'd been able to master. I can take a hit, so use me as a shield, she promised. She half expected an argument or some sort of knightly refusal. But Mass, as Surma was quickly growing to like, only grew excited. Got it, side by side then. He charged and Surma followed as she hiked up her dress. How? This instructor fell facing the boy waving, a sword as big as his mouth, yelling his head off, and the princess running in heels and a dress with a determined expression. Surma had no clue. The only thing to complete this group would be some tall hawking swinging a huge weapon. He'd have to have blonde or red fiery hair to complete the look. Focusing, Surma watched as Mass first swinging was fast and the man actually kicked off the ground with a surprised look. He struck out a leg, but Surma put up her training into action, standing in front of Mass and cast a spell. Really, it wasn't exactly a combat spell, to be honest. Really, it was a cosmetic spell that Surma had utterly butchered. He clothes became wrinkle-free as the magic smoothed the creases and wiped the dirt from her clothes. Surma's magic struggled before it did what it always did with the spell. It doubled back and the fabrics became thrice as durable, and the white dress was now able to deflect the weak dagger, something she learned in an assassination attempt one time. The leg bounced off, the man recoiled in shock. Surma followed up with a swift kick, and the man toppled over with a gasp. Whoa! Surma, you won the fight for us, Mass praised. The bonus of the spell that she used meant that Surma didn't have to worry about looking haggard or roughed up. A blessing, really. A spa, nothing else. He clearly was going easy on us and didn't use a weapon. She dismissed, but her smile made Mass grin even harder. You pass. You can tell the receptionist. That Bart gives you an eye. The man wheezed. Soma was about to help him up, but Mass was already running out of the room with her. I'm sorry, she called, needing to say something before becoming rude. Inside, she felt happy. Surma had to pass this feeling. She was pleased about passing some test. How silly was that? We are going to beat the trolls up, then rescue lords and discover the city of gold, and ride dragons, or dragon people. Mass listed with such joy. Pretty silly, but Surma started to pick up the pace and run with Mass towards the receptionist desk. The awaiting trio of her royal gods and a man Surma knew to be the guildmaster almost put a damper on her cheer, but not quite. In front of Zane and Boulder were two very odd people. The one glaring at Mass was a stout woman who had to be a dwarf. Her skin was ashen grey like stone, showing some power or influence. Her hair was hidden under a well-dented helmet, and her armor was familiar symbol stamped on it. A mountain of golden veins flowing through it. Surma could only barely remember it belonged to some deity of the earth. Her giant book, bound by an iron, had the same symbol. A priestess of some kind. You daft son of a bucket, I told you not to do anything rash. You don't bloody kidnap a princess. 
it, she demanded. Her voice was as soft as a thorny bush. Mash shrank under the woman's glare, but he held out his hand to her, still holding Surma's. Team Ultra Dragon Explorers won the test. We're bronzes. He beamed, then paused. He seemed to actually hear her words before he turned to Surma. She thinks you're a princess. You get mistaken for a lot of things, don't you? He mused. A shadow fell over them as Brolda glared hotly at the held hands. Whoa. She looks angry, Mass whispered. Soma let go before her guard killed her friend. If this is not the best time, perhaps we should just adjust the numbers until we're better ones come along. Came a smooth voice that shifted along speaking. Soma peered around Boulder to her brain shut down as a giant white furred mouse man stood there wearing a royal blue coat, fine grey trousers, some well-used wraps around the clawed feet and his face was a huge thick bottle of glasses that expanded his little beady eyes to large volumes. Zan Zan, it's a mouse! Mass pointed with a smile. The man glared at Mass. I'm clearly a ratus. Do notice the strong tail and fine fur, he retorted. He withdrew an almost ruler-like wand and gestured to his tail for an example. Mouse skin have an average of four inches smaller tail and less muscle mass as a factor of 10%. He began to lecture. Summer's mind tried to fall into her default good student mode, but it wasn't quite working. She stared at the group before her and her knights had assembled. The dwarf priestess of stone, her own personal choice of mass and the sword user, and a mouse hero. Ah, uh, Princess Summer, a pleasure. The hero in question bowed with elegance. I thought that she was the guildmaster, so you might want to double-check this princess. Just a tip. Mass nodded wisely before Zan picked him up by the ear. One more word and I'll have you so black and blue that a sea troll would look healthy in comparison. She growled. Princess, you want to tell your father that you're a bona fide bronzer, or do we make some poor servant do it? Zane yawned. The words were enough to drag Surma's gaze from the wattus. So, gentlemen, the rattus said as he turned. Her confusion must have been evident because Zane laughed at a dark chuckle. You think the royal family is going to accept the dishonor of one of their own being merely a bronzer? Think again, kiddo, she said, and Surma remembered that she was indeed a princess of the royal family, one who was expected to be the top tier of uh, anything that they pursued. Team Ultra Dragon Explorers are going for the top. Soma isn't afraid of anything. Mass promised from behind and Zan's hand. Zane looked amused, but the weirdest thing came from Lorsa. Too cute. I'm going to enjoy this. They announced to the room. Zan looked nervous and this denimen twitched as his adorable whiskers in some attempt to sense danger. Soma eyed the bronze badge that had passed her a minute later. Her reflection was smiling. How weird. She had no idea what had caused this series of events, but she gave a small, silent prayer of gratitude. This was the best day that she had ever had. Many, many miles away, Delta paused as she watched the web room fix itself. Hmm, did you say something new? She asked and the next box gave her a long, flat ding. That joke was funny for about the first 500 times. Hurry up. The option just opened up and I want to see what the requirements are. Delta rolled her eyes, but she could get why he was excited. It was the third floor after all. Delta would have to make sure that the second floor was completely ready, but she felt a tremble of buzzing excitement. This was what her menus vanishing again, and Delta spun to see the weirdest thing from the outside world yet. Kemi, an innocent girl from before, fell down her stairs and with the blindfold on. Oh, mighty goddess of truth, guide me, she yelled, and then stumbled forward, arms struck out in panic. The spiders all paused in their webbing and gave Delta the royal We Pity You dance. She took it for the intended message, but what made it all worse was that the only monster available capable of speech besides Maestro, who did short musical bursts, was Swar. The rest were busy and Pharaoh would not leave her post. Mushi had gone to the second floor to show his new powers to the pygmies. Hob and Gob were out gathering and Billy and Num were blackout drunk under the tavern table. 
Delta felt a headache coming already, and she called for Soir. What kind of person wandered into a dungeon blind? Well, besides Delta, but she didn't have a choice. Ignoring the feeling of dread, Delta put on a winning smile and was sure that she would get this sorted in a few minutes. Before Kimmy fell down some hole Delta didn't even know that she had, or something. It would just be Delta's luck. End of chapter. There is no epic lucha, only puns. Chapter 74, Blind Truth. The Scarlet Moons were an odd group. Not like Delta's other guests, everyone else, even Dio, Poppy and Amonster, felt like they were merely toying with her. This group had actually struggled on some level. On one hand, Delta felt worried as they fled and hadn't returned. On the other hand, Delta was glad nothing else was on fire. The group was good at fire, if nothing else. Kemi, the calm one, had gotten the idea while the older woman, who seemed to act like her older sister, Hania, was more on guard. Gongo was simple, but a terrible person. Delta likened him to her own Swa, a fellow rather prone to burst of chaotic fire. Delta wanted to blame him for everything, but really, the issue was that Delta had no idea that Bori would transform. It spoke of many menus and boxes that she had yet to learn of. Condition box, mini boss potential. Delta sighed as she perked up slightly as Mr. Lord Mushy calmly seemed to go about helping the regrowing mushrooms look neat and slightly bigger. The whole adventure of the group had been another eye-opener. Delta wasn't weak enough to be beaten by teens. She was only beaten by Durance teens. That had been a slight mistake that she had made and one that she could now see as an error. Kemi, Ania, Gonga and the other guy were not ready for her first floor, let alone her second. What if Wine got a hold of them? Dalton knew so little about her second floor boss, but this was more due to time and upgrades. No. Dalton couldn't risk these people making it past her bar, let alone Sir Fran. What if they upset the bees and pissed off Rail? Dalton shivered as the image of Bob swinging Kemi about like he had done with Grimm. What if they broke? Dalton gulped as she floated down the second corridor. While the group had given her some mana and DP, it was far less than Rooney's average's visits, or even Dio. Was there a level of difference? Delta had no idea that Jurens had such experts in the midst. Rudy, when Quiz were the strongest protectors, some sort of guardians, Delta blinked slowly. Rudy snacked off as a guardian, Quiz was too mean to be someone people turned to as well. But she could deny their power. Navagast was nice, but weird. Isanella, that woman, was someone Delta didn't know very well. How many more scary people called Durance home? Couldn't be many, right? The thought made her head hurt, and she didn't even notice where she ended up. Powerful friends may become powerful foes. Wyman said calmly, her form appearing to be a suggestive woman surrounded in a mist, but Delta could see her real form. A deadly wooden figure with thorns glaring eyes. Delta looked up at her. They've been nothing but nice. It's just these new people that are an issue. Kami is sweet, but the rest expect me to be a murder dungeon. Delta whispered, why in load of branches and acted as her arms. Then they will be unkind and come back with more anger. Best to deal with them, then. Those who do not respect your kindness do not deserve it. She said bluntly, Delta looked up and startled. As always, I find you being nothing but trouble. Other dungeons may be animalistic and quick to act, but Delta has made your own path. If you have any self-respect as a boss, you won't question that. News tax box announced suddenly. Wyam leaned back as if New had burned her leaves in some manner. Mother encourages thought. If you protest that, then I have to assume that you disagree and thus I should remove you. Wyan hissed. News box was blank for a second. Delta's kindness is not to be disrespected or abused by anyone. The threats were glaring, were not helping her mood. Surprisingly, both the tree and the box seemed to turn to her. Delta? Mother? The concern seemed real from both sides, and they only made it all worse. How could Delta tell one or the other off when they felt so honestly worried about her? Was Wyam just being overly aggressive, or was New being overly protective? Did the Scarlet Moons deserve such treatment just because they did some damage? No. 
They did what was logical and reasonable for a dungeon. If I'm the odd one out, I can't expect people to behave the way I want. She said aloud, the thought finally hitting her. Other dungeons really did exist. Delta was the weird one, and the other ones, no. Little to no issue with just killing. How did they think about it? Did they think? Did wolves ponder the moral issue of eating deer? Was Delta really the freak in this situation? The thought oddly liberated Delta in a way that she hadn't thought before. Defying expectations and making her pit of death into a home, that made Delta happy, simply because it apparently should have freaked her out. Wyan knew. Thank you, but I think that I should be wrong, a lot, and I should take action against folks. I give too much leeway too. I should learn, right? If I just keep repeating mistakes, I'm just as bad as the murder hobos coming to the dungeon to grind. She announced, Murder hobo? Wyan frowned. Her face made a smooth wood crease into a frown. Overly passionate adventurers that prefer winning over experience, Delta amended. She turned and looked at the first floor. Learning was the key to make sure that her dream would come true. Those who refused to learn would be doomed to repeat it, right? She moved and ended up in the mushroom grove. She focused on a single plain signboard, appeared. Sorry, new, gonna have to borrow your gimmick, she said sheepishly, and she made words appear. If you didn't, I would have. Still, I have doubts these people will read it, let alone follow the instructions. Something about idiots and clear instructions do not mesh. Delta snorted and tried to pretend that she was focusing on the sign. Fire will result in explosions. She'd never make or encourage any dungeon designs that would seek the death of those who would enter. But if someone was stubbornly determined to bash the heads on the wall, Delta could only provide so many pillows. Do you think the other dungeons enjoy killing people? Delta asked after a moment. And it was silent for all the following moments. No. Sis tells me that others don't enjoy it as much as Deal. A matter of life, a simple expectation. No more interesting than harvesting grain. You are far more interesting due to your odd oaths and choices. It has resulted in more uh, outcomes than I had imagined. Stop, I'll blush, Delta suddenly teased. Weird outcomes, but still, the results are not the same. You are the oddest dungeon core that I've ever, ever, ever. Delta turned and saw Nu's box frizzle as if overheating. Nu, she yelled, and to her relief the box righted itself. Sorry, I went in an odd with thought pattern. I blame you, of course. Only you can make me feel anything other than purpose and duty. Speaking of, I'm going to add more science and a few tweaks while we decide what to do next. Hobbering is just not my style. Dalton couldn't answer before the box had fled, but she had a feeling that sudden shyness from new. Weird. Sis, are there any more potential bosses as such? She called and no such box appeared. Looks like since Bori had a room guardian status, it was likely to evolve. After all, Maestro, Lord Mushy, Farah, Waddles were all rather beyond the conditional bosses. Delta honestly couldn't be sure how to feel about it all, that other than she was glad to have friends. Delta thought about what to do, and honestly, any grand plans were pushed back as she silently watched the fire damage reverse itself, and maybe in a few months, years, she would stop watching as the damage repaired itself, but not now. Right now, Dalton needed to see that everything was going to be okay. Like an anxious parent after the child hit their head, worried but still caring. Mostly, she focused on the grove and spider room, the two biggest targets of Gonga's flames. Gonga's fire honestly didn't upset Dalton. Something about the man seemed awkward with magic. Dalton wondered why he didn't use a sword when clearly his mana rejected the magic that he forced on it. Reason? Stubbornness? Whatever it was, Delta felt deep of wool and pain when Gonga used the magic that she couldn't dislike the man. His casting had a tinge of his inner soul, and it made Delta want to know more. She hoped he, Ania, and Kemi came back peacefully, just so that she could find out more. Lordy soon declared that the grove to be on a healthy enough level to be left alone. He no longer waddled, but strode with a jolly step towards the stairs. I must see the little rascals of the second floor. No doubt they'll be surprised, he exclaimed as a tall with his moustache. Delta giggled and walked beside him, 
To her surprise, he extended one arm and nodded for her to slip her own through. Amused, since this act was merely pretending since she couldn't touch things, Delta did so and let Lordy escort her like some lady. How do you feel? Evolving, I mean. She asked, interested, on what a second evolution felt like to someone like Lordy. A crown cap tilted up as he hummed in thought. It's akin to waking up and having your dreams come back to you. You're not less, but you are more. I was Mr. Mushy, and still am, but now there is more to me than makes me Lord Mushy, he said a little wistfully, like the moustache. Dalton nodded in agreement. Her monster chortled as he twisted the moustache in response. Lord Mushy without his moustache is no lord at all. He agreed. Delta broke into a laugh, smiling as they reached the stairs. She bid Lordy a good trip and turned, running almost through a box. It wasn't new, but the general system message. Dungeon has reached enough experience to gain a third floor. Summary. Conditions needed. Second floor boss summoned. Four or more rooms formed. General critters five or more created. Monsters on the level five or more. Of which are contracted one. Kill zero wins one. Items absorbed on the second floor. Minimal. Manament found. Not enough. Correction. Additional points found by system. Theme jungle. Core developed heavily into the theme. Unique evolutions. Rail the river lord. Thriving ecosystem developed. Challenging gates for the bosses created. Unique boss summoned via rare magical seed. Powerful monster summoned by chance. Garth's secret tunnel. Lost circus victims of Rrrr found. Rare monster contracted. Creative use of fire crystals. Monsters developed to think greater than most bosses. Able to think and react rather than repeat mistakes. System states enough points have been gathered. Third floor purchase is now available at Call's request. On one hand, I feel like I fell as a dungeon. On the other, I think I did well, despite that. One win. Delta ran closely. Oh, come on. Grim passed out. That was hardly a win, she mumbled. Finally. I was thinking the third floor was going to need some actual deaths to appear. Glad to see Zis nudged it a little. Delta looked at the blue box that appeared by her side. Should I be worried that you were willing to think about killing people to hurry things up? She asked Riley. No, not at all. So, now that we can go deeper, new opportunities, new monsters. New was excited, if nothing else. Delta watched the box close. With some flickering of her fingers, she found the upgrade, listed right there, as if it was nothing special. Third floor, purchase 300 DP. Delta couldn't help feeling a little amused. It wasn't that much, all things considered. With some saving and the sheer amount of spiders that her coverings could have back with, Delta looked at a menu. 308 DP, 101 mana. Delta could purchase it right now. The temptation was so strong for a moment that it scared Delta into taking a step back. Growing, making more of her home, that couldn't be a bad thing. Right? Right? To be honest, there was still a lot to do on the second floor. Some adjustments had to be made on the first floor. If she made the third floor right as this moment, she'd be adding to her plate without really making sure her foundations were solid. If the foundations were on the ceiling, and that was. Spreading herself too thin might make the whole ordeal worse. Not to mention there could be more things like the Slimers and Rennie waiting for her. What if Delta couldn't stop them due to unfinished second floor and a call for aid? Delta pursed her lips. Her monsters found it easier to go down a level than up. Rayom and the others struggled to climb up to the first floor stairs, but Swa and the others didn't have too much of an issue coming down. Delta was assuming it had something to do with the level of mana on each floor, like going to a high on a mountain and then thinned out for people. Of course, if worse came to worse, she would be able to summon her monsters from the second floor to deal with any potential threats on the third. But if she was going to do that route, then the second floor deserved to be properly tuned up. Delta nodded. She closed the box and ignored the sulking new. Come on, let's go see how the spiders are getting on, she smiled. It wasn't like the third floor was going anywhere. Rennie moved his hands around and around as he sat on a rock near the waterfall pool. 
He tugged as his paw fought resistance. He mimed, struggling, and soon enough, he managed to reel Bob out. The two tiny red crabs clattered in the distance and anger at Rennie. He merely tilted his head as they grudgingly handed over the smooth and shiny pebbles. A deal was a deal. The crabs would know better than to make a bet with Rennie in the future. The circus worker never suffered bad luck in games. Bob wiggled and slowly lowered its head so that Rennie could pet the shiny body. Another win for the ringmaster, Rennie. Rail boomed as the muscular body emerged from the river nearby. It didn't seem to bother Rail that neither Rennie, Bob, or the crabs could answer back. That makes 34 to 0 to the mine, he mused. The crabs snapped their claws, annoyed. Rennie had to admit he was running out of pocket space for all of these rocks. Rail smacked Rennie's back hard and nearly moved Rennie. The frog's strength was insane. Rennie was glad he was contracted before Rail evolved. Fighting a furious river lord would not be fun. A bush nearby rustled, and the form of Davina manifested as if created by the shadows and green leaves. Her casual calm expression looked a little uh, displeased. Her bird, Dalbird, was there, but it looked annoyed. It wasn't hard to see why when both of them looked up the cupboard and tiny fluffy dots. Ran into the munchkins, great little things, right? Rail beamed. There was a chuckle of mystic energy as Davina's eyes twitched. The bird on her shoulder puffed up. They are little ass. The bird began. Davina softly shut its beak with her fingers. As ironic as the word's comment is, they mistook me for an evil goddess coming to seduce their uh, god. Have you seen the mushies? He has evolved. He looks. He talks. Divina informed the group. Rail was gone in an instant, swallowed by the water and a cheer. Rennie was always tempted to follow, but Divina walked out to him. I require assistance to remove the dots. The crabs would pinch and bob. She looked at the creature. He sang at her in confusion. Bob is here for emotional support, she finally said. Rennie eyed the frog and the bird. He would say to anyone, if he ever spoke, that the second floor was no slouch in drama compared to the first floor, and he would fight anyone who would argue. Delta looked down as Kemi, the girl who just left her dungeon, wandered back in. The oddest thing was the pure white cloth around her eyes. The golden symbol of the hand switched into a cloth, and a little lopsided. Delta guessed that Kemi had stitched it herself. The goddess of truth guide my path. She called and began to slowly walk forward. Her hand stretched out in front of her and the ward off any bad vibes. The girl's robes were a little dirty. Signs that she may have tripped on the way to dancers. All down the stairs needed to be a bit of cleaning if she had made much dirt on it in one fall. I have no idea what you're doing. Delta stated bluntly to the girl that couldn't hear her. Thankfully... Maybe Swan was on his way to act as a mouthpiece. Kemi managed to slowly walk into the tunnel, and she was moving erratically. She stepped lightly, right, and then popped out the sign. New and designed, Mr. By Inches. May the truth find me in this darkness. May I find the light in the truth. Kemi whispered to herself quietly. Swan rounded the corner, blinking as he saw the blind human walking with the arm stretched out. He rubbed his eyes and blinked looking it in to see if he had indeed not gone insane. Swan, do something. She's going to walk into the wall, Delta urged. Swan gave her a side look before he grinned. I live to serve. He promised and Delta felt tinges of panic rising up. Swan slid across the wall and waited until Kemi neared, repeating her prayer over and over. Swan, Delta both asked and warned, the goblin inhaled, and with an attempt at a sweet and motherly tone that could come out of a crooked and sickly, he spoke. Don't left, my child, he breathed, making his voice seem distant. Kemi almost stumbled there, and then. Who? Who? Hello? Kemi stood still, holding her arms to her chest as if to shield herself. Swa's evil smoke made Delta regret this. Swa, don't you dare confuse her. She said with a frown. Swa shrugged before he continued. It's me, your goddess. I have heard your prayers. You must turn left. He crooned again. Kemi's body shook just a little. My, my goddess, 
She breathed an awe before hesitating. You sound odd, she pointed out and swore sniffed. The goddess has a cold. Now, child, gods can get colds. How does that work? I thought you existed as a light within us all. Gemi mused to herself. Magical colds exist, and I have a tough job. Swan fired back, voice returning to his normal for a moment. I think you're lying. I know when people lie. Who are you? Kemi responded, firm but not unkind. Delta sighed with relief. The girl seemed to be rather aware of things. Well, I could have been a god. Swan sniffed Kemi bowed, but didn't remove her blindfold. I don't think you need to be a god. I find being a person is just good enough. You could eat things and sleep. They are very nice things to experience. Kemi said with honest feelings. Swa looked down at himself. Person. Right. Okay, fine. I am not a god, but I am better. I am Swa of the flame, servant and warrior of the Delta dungeon. I shall burn the cruel and feed their ashes to mother's kindness. And mushroom, Swa growled. Kemi gulped a little. I... Had enough fire for now. I'd like to do a special ritual in the dungeon if Delta is okay with it. Kemi asked, fingers intertwining nervously, fiddling across each other. The goblin looked at Delta as she peered closely at her guest. No matter how deeply Delta looked or searched, Kemi gave off no ill will. Sure, if she doesn't mind explaining, she answered. Mother said you can do it, but we want to know what's going to happen. Swan repeated her words in a manner that was close enough. Kemi perked up. Oh, thank you. Delta is really nice dungeon. I'll bring some mushrooms for her. I saw she really likes them. Kemi bowed again, and Delta felt a deep stab of pain in her chest. Swa, tell her no more. Tell her I don't like them. Not most of them. Delta pleaded, and Swa dug into his ears with his claws. Hmm, kind of went deaf, he mumbled with a grin. Delta would ban the damn cotton from the tavern. Vera would understand. My sick, Kemi began, and touched the necklace she wore. I am conflicted about my time in Delta's dungeon. On one hand, I felt nothing but a peaceful trip, where the only issue came from my group's overthinking. The grove was different, and I wanted to know what happened, and experience the dungeon in a new light. I will not trust my eyes, for they see what they wish. I will trust my voice, my ears, and my heart. The goddess of truth will guide me as I travel the dungeon once more. Kemi breathed out and seemed to gather a little more confidence about herself. Delta stared as she couldn't help but smile. Thank you, thank you for giving me a chance, she said quietly, but the emotion made her choke a little. A breeze brushed past Kemi and she dumped. Well, was that a woman? Kemi asked, turning slightly to follow the breeze. She shrugged as Delta held her hand to her throat. Hello? Delta called, but Kemi didn't react. Swa looked around. So what? What do we do? Stay out of your way. He scratches his nose and Kemi shook her head. Do as you wish. I'm not here to alter things, but to learn. My goddess will guide me where I must be. Kemi responded with courage before she faltered. But I would appreciate some guidance through the spider room. I don't want to mess up their webs if they've just started to fix them. Kemi murmured, head a little low, if burdening, by the flame of her team on herself. Delta wanted to keep her. The skill was too much. Swa shrugged before remembering that Kemi was blind. Follow the sound of my voice, he instructed gruffly. Kemi giggled and moved forward before she almost tripped over her robe. Okay, Mr. Swa, I am in your hands, she said brightly. The goblin paused. Master Swa, he corrected. Kemi faltered, but she poked up. M Master Swa, she corrected herself. Swa, don't go making random girls into your students or slaves, Delta chided as the smoking goblin. Mother would like to remind you that all would like ten mushrooms for the privilege of my guidance, he said, and Kemi frowned. I am not sure you're telling me the truth. Look, you're almost stepped on a spider, Swa pointed to the empty air. Kemi attempted to hover by lifting both feet off of the ground. She managed to obtain flight for about three seconds before crashing down. Less back chat and more listening to my wisdom, Swa said haughtily. Delta was doing her best to ping Num or Billy, but both seemed to be passed out. Hob and Gob were all gone, Ferra wouldn't leave her bar, Vori was sleeping in a coma patient, Waddles couldn't speak and Maestro was everywhere but nowhere. 
Lordy would be so helpful here. Delta watched, following Kemi re-entering the spider room, and all the little silver beings watched with surprise. One danced with the a guest, while the fellow one nearby responded with the famous I have eight eyes, I am not blind dance. Truly, this was a culture of great grace. Muffet, said in form, watched the weaker and frail without the condition of the other spider's death, casually dropping on Kemi's head. The girl squeaked, rising her hands, delicately to feel the soft form. The chittering chat of Muffet must have been familiar, because Kemi's other hand went to the white earmuffs on her throat. The white spider, Muffet, that's your name, right? Kemi asked, and Muffet raised one leg to the other and did a dance with both Hail Muffet and It's Time for Tea. Kemi was careful not to removing her head to avoid making Muffet fall. Muffet slowly reached down and tapped Kemi's nose with a frail leg, and the action caused Kemi to giggle. Thank you for your gift, Kemi breathed. Muffet chittered and clacked her fangs with a casual tone. Delta could pretty sure that Kemi didn't speak spider, but the scene was fun to watch. Still, Delta's eyes wandered to the rest of the dungeon, the challenges that awaited Kemi's journey, the mudroom, the grove, the fort room. It was not easy for someone without eyes. The other route would be easier, but that meant introducing Kemi to Maestro, which would work. Kemi was blindfolded and couldn't see Maestro. He was a fantastic monster, but he was slightly, uh, nightmarish, but in a good way. Delta just needed to get Kemi to past Waddles, and Mary, and Farah. What if Kemi went to the boss room? How would that work? Delta silently turned back to the giggling girl as Muff began to tie her hair up and use her eight legs to make a rather nice bun for the girl to show off her face more. It would work. Delta just had to take a cue from Kemi to have faith. Faith that Delta's own hard work would pay off. End of chapter. There is no happy lucha, only puns. Chapter 75, Heart to Heart. She was hovering. Delta knew that, but it was hard to pull herself away from another human being. There was something that felt like relief whenever she saw another person. Her home was lovely, her friends were just great, but knowing that there was a life beyond her walls, it relieved Delta to a great degree. Muffet decided to cling to Kimmy for a while longer, as Swa loudly declared how she was lucky to be getting such a tour. The girl was interested, and she listened intently, asking questions as they approached the pond room. The glowing ceiling of moss and torches made Kimmy's swarm look uh, peaceful. Odd, considering that she was in a dungeon, but Delta took that as a compliment. What is it like living in a dungeon? Kimmy asked as Muffet's legs undid her work and began to make another hairstyle. The spider seemed to be greatly enjoying weaving Kenny's hair into different styles. The more she did, the more Muffet seemed to get better at it and would chitter cheerfully. What is it like being out there? I think it has to suck, saw ever so graceful one stated. Kemi stumbled ever so slightly. What? No, if anything it must be so small in here. It's easy to see how one could feel trapped. Kemi argued. Delta gave her a point for that. She had at first... It was odd how much Delta had adapted to these walls, to never seeing the sky proper. The jungle helped, but Delta hoped that she could make some sort of working sky on one of her floors, maybe floor three. A large plane or something which the stars twinkled. Trapped, everything is clear. This is my world. It changes a little every day. Everything here works for the same reason. Mother. We can argue or even dislike one another, but no one doubts our loyalty. You lot can't even grow up together and be sure of that. Besides, our world is small now. Mother is immortal as are we. Our world will grow into the biggest, weirdest, oddest, quite frankly, and I am expecting a mind-shatteringly wondrous of the world. I shall experience every inch in my own time. Swar said with conviction. Delta stared until Kemi's small voice broke the silence. I didn't think about it like that. But what about the sun? Meeting new people or being able to choose how to live your life? Kemi asked quickly. Swa snorted. I chose to be myself. Otherwise, I'd be some smarty, polite git. I wanted fire, but I was originally destined to serve as a greeter. I hated it, but I accepted that. 
but not mother. She freed me from that, and I'm a goblin, you fear. Freedom. I have far more freedom than you. I was literally freed from my fate. He growled with a hint of a warning. Swar, Delta said, her chest tight. She hadn't guessed that her actions had meant that much to him. Kemi was quiet for a few seconds as Swar took keys from the waiting models. What is Delta like? I keep feeling like she doesn't make sense, but she sounds... Kemi stopped to pick the words carefully. Even Mufford seemed to stop reading to listen. Human. Delta felt her chest tightening, but she said nothing. Mother is mother. How can I, any of us, describe how warm the air is when she speaks to us? How the ground beneath us is solid when her compassion? How our magic and thoughts flow free from her consent? She is our world, and we are her children. Human is almost insulting, Swa said quietly. Quack. Waddles added, making Kenny jump. Mr. Duck, she gasped. Even those that are more employed than raised feel that Delta is better than any old smutty human. Swa translated with a smug grin. Delta could take a compliment. Swa so rarely gave them. I'm a smutty old human, Kemi protested weakly. We're working on that, Swa agreed. He took the key out of the storage room and walked loudly as if he stopped so Kemi could follow with her ears. Kemi did so, stopping before she felt a bumping into her knees. She bent down slowly and touched the feathered head of Waddles. She gasped as she smiled. Mr. Duck, she said, and she picked him up. The duck looked unfazed as Kemi carried him off. The spider in her hair and the duck in her arms. Kemi looked odd, yet cute at the same time. She seemed to be pet to both of them in slow motion, as if feeling something beside the spider hair and the duck feathers. She inhaled through her nose, and if her dungeon had more than the scent of a damp earth and mushrooms. Every step, Kemi seemed to be learning something that Delta couldn't see or hear. It made the petite girl more interesting by the second. Delta knew that she could go to the second floor and start working while Kemi's presence locked the first floor down. But she was just having too much fun with this. How often did a girl blindfold herself and then do your dungeon blind? Delta was confident that it couldn't happen often. The hot springs on the second floor were an odd contrast with the rest of the dungeon. Hypocritical of Rennie to say, of his own turf was the circus of all things, but at the end of the day these two places seemed to enhance the jungle, as if tripped onto secrets that the jungle graciously allowed you to find. Rennie hadn't visited the place himself, and he might have to come more often. The jungle itself was warm, but this place was just relaxing as a stream, and sense of cleanliness soaked into him. His dark mind suit was a little damp after the years of being in hibernation underground. Rennie guessed it could do with a clean. He wouldn't get in the water, as his access to the softly bubbling pool was blocked by a young frog in a dress and heels, of all things in the jungle. Her slight bowed legs and already tall nature made Rennie crane his neck. Master Rennie! Welcome to the Delta Spring, a pool of peace and trust. The girl bowed. Then she looked at him for a split second. People can become overcooked and drown in the hot springs. Isn't that neat? She said brightly. Rennie would have to disagree, but he wasn't here to start a fight. My name is Luna, guardian of the springs. Not much to see, but Mum is going to spruce this place up when she gets a minute. Luna explained, brushing her robe down, which was covered in stars and half-moons. So you're the key guardian as well? Luna asked lightly. Rennie tilted his head before, nodding. Interesting concept for Delta, but he would roll with it. I still haven't figured out my test, but I can't wait until I get some improvements. I was going to visit Wyam. The doors unlock for us monsters without keys, which is nice. What's your trial going to be? She asked, saying this all very quickly. Rennie felt a key in his pocket. Trial. Yeah. He would have to do something to make people work for it. The bees had it easy, as did the little crazy mushrooms. Even Bob was simple in his design. His quick guess was a large frog giant would be doing physical combat for his. He and Luna. It was tricky. He had a point in that both of their areas were massively underdeveloped by Delta. Not 
that he minded. The statue of his father and the space for Wilhelm was more than he could have ever asked for. Well, that and having his hunger dealt with. That was something he had never had in his life. Even with his father, his ghoul nature had uh, issues. He ignored the troubling memories and focused on Luna. He merely gave a shrug of one of his shoulders. What more could he say? Yeah, I feel the same. Luna blew out a sigh. Rennie merely looked skyward. He had a feeling that the second floor was about to get interesting, that he and Luna wouldn't have to wait long for those desired changes. The question was if they could handle it. Delta did have a bit of a habit of, well, to put it bluntly, being crazy. Her power and changes were not normal. Under her less kind call, Rennie might have been worried. Under a lesser call, he might have done his best to break free. Not with Delta. He merely waited to see what odd things that she would do next. It was bound to be funny for a while before becoming terrifying in hindsight. Such was Delta's dungeon. Kemi felt a creaking wood close behind her. Swar the goblin had led her to the storeroom. She was sure of it. The clicking on the locked door, the smell of pots and stored wood of the shelves, the taste that mingled in the air was the slight feast of apples, honey, and cooked meat. It was enough to make Kemi drool, but she remembered the mouse. Oh, she remembered the mouse. But Swan had led her on it despite the room looking small. He grunted something, and soon they all walked on. Some secret tunnel. Something only monsters could open. Kemi didn't know, but the tunnel felt warm and moist. The growing smell of what she was rapidly coming to know, as mushrooms was becoming strong. Almost the same level as the grove of mushrooms, her hair felt slight tug as Miss Muffet rearranged her hair again. It was nice having such a tiny hands, uh, legs, tugging and messing with her hair. She had no idea if the spider knew of human hairstyles, but short of a disaster, Kemi wouldn't mind. The duck in her arms was quiet, but Kemi also took comfort in his warm frame. He was so light that she had little trouble carrying him for so long. Soon Swan tapped his staff and stood, and Kemi came to a halt. I'd take you on Woods, but all the listening stuff made me think that you should take a minute here. Well, that and Stro wouldn't let us pass without at least a comment or ten. Swan grumbled, his voice soft as prickly thorns. Here? she asked politely. The heat had risen to a new level, but Kemi's senses tingled. Something was all around her. Her nose smelled mushrooms, and her ears picked up a slight rustling. Swa didn't answer, but a new voice did. This voice made a shiver dance in a way down her spine. The place where all the core cats hang, sweet thing. The voice said in a mirth all around her. The male's words seemed to dance against her body. Hello, she called, holding waddles tightly. Greeting salutations, I can't wait to celebrate this meeting. The voice laughed. There was no menace or tension, but the voice rang through Kemi. It was a familiar way. She had heard this voice before. My name is Kemi. She bowed slightly. Kemi, Kemi. Well, that is a lovely name. Not as much as mine, of course, but I am biased. I am Maestro. The voice boomed and Kemi took a step back, startled. Maestro, a musical monster? How odd. So, no eyes and all ears. I can't say that I hate it at all. Maestro chuckled. He had a nice laugh, not a mean one. He'd laugh as if everything was just that, funny. Like life was not serious and Kemi thought. Swa, my lad, why don't you go grab a drink before Mother banned you? Maestro offered. The goblin snorted. I doubt she'll follow through with that threat, but I better drink just in case, he agreed. Kemi didn't hear the staff who couldn't follow the goblin as Maestro talked over his steps. Kemi, tell Maestro what are you doing here? The voice encouraged. I came to see the truth of Delta, she repeated. Blind, came a surprised question. Kemi nodded and shifted forward, her foot touching solid stone step. She blinked. Maestro sounded like he was right in front of her. It's easier to open your mind if you stop judging everyone with your eyes. The truth will form easier if I stop seeing everything that the way I want to, she explained. Sometimes what you see is what you get. Maestro suggested and Kemi shook her head. 
A rock can hide precious metals. A seed can grow into a medical plant. A drunk on the street could have been a great soldier or a hero at one point. She said with a solid conviction that came from her faith. Appearances can be deceiving. Maestro summed up. Basically, Kemi said, her cheeks going red. That was when she heard a slight sound of strings being played. Sometimes a bad person just looks, but I could see your point. Ah, who knows what hidden music each person can hold. Tell me, do you sing? Maestro asked. Kemi blinked behind her blindfold. Not well, just a few hymns from my church. Why? She climbed another few steps. Maestro's voice seemed to come from both sides of her. I happen to also use different methods to judge someone. You ignore your eyes and I ignore the physical appearance. I use my ears, Maestro said, his voice subtly changing to be lower. Music. Music is hard to fake when one puts their soul into it, he added. Music. Music. Kemi stopped climbing this odd structure. Tell me, Kemi, as you seek the truth of Delta, will you allow me to see your truth? The room went quiet as Maestro's voice came from directly above her. It seemed to be the first time that she had heard him speak from his own lips. If he had lips, Kemi had no idea. What was Maestro exactly? He didn't sound like a goblin. I... You want me to sing? Kemi asked, hesitating for a moment. Maestro laughed again. You make it sound so grave. I'm no sea witch. You can sing without fear, if you do so. Honestly, then I shall share a secret of mother. A little treat, hmm? Maestro's tempted into her ears. Kemi shivered. Sure, I guess. Like I said, I don't know more than a few hymns and a fair few drunk bar songs because gonga. But still, it sticks to the hymns. Kemi said quickly, almost sensing Maestro smiling. Still, the tip wasn't any use to Kemi. It could only be something useful for the moons. Any little info helped, and then girled in the long run. Okay, here I go. Kemi inhaled and tried to get her stage fright to calm down. Sing, I'll help, Maestro encouraged. The hymn Kemi used was her favorite of all, The Truth of Love. The song was quaint and not often sung when Kemi was a simple sister of the church, but she slowly began the first line of the song. Closing her eyes, despite her blindfold, she pretended she was back in a small chapel, the days that seemed more magical due to the power of memories. The way that the main hall looked like a secret realm as the sun shimmered through the stained glass depicting her goddess in various acts through her tales. She sang. The sound of the piano and his soft harp strings sounded out in time. It almost made Kemi stumble over the next few words, but she caught herself. The song was about her goddess, and how she praised to love between two people. The pure, honest affection and love they displayed had moved even her goddess. The song went through hard talks that they shared, the love that they declared, and the honest words when they promised each other that they would never be apart. Kemi felt braver and more relaxed with each line sang. Maestro somehow managed to make the soft strings and the piano sound just like a music teacher of the chapel, each note softly, in time, but not overpowering or harsh. The longest of moments, Kemi felt like she was at home, and she felt Muffet reaching down to catch a tear that she hadn't felt fall. Kemi was neither the best singer or the most dedicated learner. She was sure that she had missed a few words and notes, but she sang until she was out of words. The music slowly stopped, and then there was silence. A warm pause after all was said and done. Wonderful. I can see why she likes you, Maestro said, breaking the moment. Kemi shrugged and gathered her scattered emotions back together. Maestro sounded affectionate in an odd way. Kemi shuddered as she breathed. You were a very good player. The instruments were very well practiced. She praised back, needing to say something. Oh, hush, you little charmer. I'm a monster of my word. A tip for you. Maestro's voice dripped into a whisper. Kindness gets you much farther than a blade. If it comes down to combat, to death, you've missed something, he said. Kemi was beginning to see that for herself. Mother said your voice is great and you shouldn't be shy. Maestro said suddenly, that made Kemi blush a little harder. Well, let's get you to Vera. Turn around and stick your hand out, 
Maestro instructed, and Kemi did so, and something grew, and from the ground, until it bumped into her hand. Soft and spongy. The mushrooms will guide you. Don't worry, it wouldn't do well for my feng shui if you fell unconscious at the bottom of the stairs from tripping, he chuckled. More mushrooms grew until they formed an almost safety rail. Thank you, Kemi burst out with a smile. Holding on, she reached to the bottom of the stone steps and the rail carried on, twisting around until Kemi reached another tunnel. Waddles quacked and Muffet chittered. Onwards, Kemi agreed. Delta watched the girl walk slowly towards the kitchen area of the bar. She would be okay. Little Kemi has got a tune, not like a Zanella, but she's pretty good, Maestro said to her, his large demonic face of thin fingers that looked designed to drag unfortunate people under the water. Flexed. Maestro, was she happy or sad when she sang? Delta asked quietly. Maestro examined his fingers for a moment before answering. One can be both. I felt sadness was more of a uh, homesick vibe. Felt awful. Good thing I never planned to leave home, Maestro announced. Yeah, you gotta live here and rent free as well, Delta complained as she was smiling just a little. I do the music. How can you ignore my amazing contributions to our lovely home? Maestro gasped, acting as if Dalton had wounded him. Because half the music you try to play is rude or Benny Hill. When something happened to the moons, she reminded Maestro chuckled. I can't wait until you make a large fall areas. I have Wilhelm's scream lined up, he admitted. Delta shook her head and floated off to Kemi. Kemi hesitated as something pushed her in the hand. She had merely opened the door before some gruff woman had escorted her. Somewhere, the scent of cooking food and rich aromas had taken her by complete surprise. Why was there a delicious smell in the dungeon? Something hissed, something bubbled. It was like a kitchen, almost. The woman had sat her on a stool, and from an odd moment, Kemi felt like she might have just drifted off to sleep, endurance and woken up in a tavern. But that was pop when Swa nudged her. Come on, we have some shroom pop, he encouraged. The mug in her hands felt cold, so Kemi gulped slightly before sipping it. She slowly put the mug down. The taste was, well, Kemi sipped it again. It was kind of earthy, but it turned sweet as it passed the tongue. After a moment, the sweetness melted away into a distant mushroom aftertaste. Kimmy liked mushrooms, but this was giving her tongue a midlife crisis. It tasted good like pop of the alcohol, but it was also made from mushrooms. How about something harder? A new voice called from the back of the room. Nama, you idiot. The girl looks like as old as me. She ain't got no ale until I know better. The woman growled. Sorry, Farah, Num said and cowed. Thank you for the drink, Kemi said as she sipped more of the complex liquid. It's all right, darling. You're only guest. Mama said to treat you right. Hair a nice girl. Shame you got Swa as a guide. Farah snorted. There was just a grunt as Swa put his staff on the bar. What do you mean by that? He asked in annoyance. Vera was quiet for a moment before she put something heavy and made from metal on the bar as well. What do you think I mean? Vera said back. Voice smug. Swan grumbled, but Kemi's amazement, he didn't back sass Vera. You gobos think that you're all so strong. Vera said before refilling Kemi's drink, without asking Kemi if she wanted more. Kemi sort of did, but also sort of didn't. This drink was upsetting her in a spiritual level. Kemi didn't reject the refilling mug. Where am I? Kemi said, holding her moral dilemma in the form as she drank it with both hands. Swarthy hog, darling, my place and the breast of point of the four folks. The last room before the big cheese himself, Vera explained as the sound of the wet cloth began to wipe down the bar. Big cheese? She asked, afraid that Haldi had found her and came for more cheese. Fran the pig knight, Vera answered. There was a sudden clatter of mugs as every person in the bar and there was more than Kemi had known about. All cheered. To Fran! They all had called and drank. Kemi sipped, and the drink in her hands, excited but unsure at the taste. Here you go, Muffet. Spiders in the corner are waiting for you. I think that's what they're saying. That all they're so drunk that they're dancing up for dancing. 
Farah seemed to pass something to Muffet. The spider crawled down from Kemi's face and seemed to nuzzle her before she crawled away. Kemi giggled and waved. Bye, Muffet. She was feeling rather warm. She drank more of the pop. Waddles quacked and more of a demand than a random noise. Listen, I can't make that drink. I don't have access to souls of the Nixian River or Infernal Brimstone. Just drink water or pop for now, Vera grumbled. Those were odd ingredients. Then again, alcohol had always been a dramatic business. Kemi was sure it was some weird duck drink that had barely any buzz to it. She giggled again. Duck drinks. She drained the mug and Ferret filled it up again for free. Kemi was so happy. Fran, the pig knight, he sounds important. Kemi finally said, He is the boss of this floor. He deserves some respect. Ferret agreed. This made Kemi sit up straight. The boss. The bar is next to the boss room, she said with a shock. Isn't Mama nice? Vera agreed. Kimmy felt her heart speed up as she was less than a tunnel away from the most deadliest creature in this dungeon so far. The boss. Kimmy drained her mug in a single gulp. She hated this drink, but she also loved it. Is he dangerous? Kimmy asked aloud. Vera cleared her throat. He's serious about his job. I barely get him to come in here for a drink, she admitted. Kimmy was nodding before the woman's words caught up with her. She almost spit her drink out and came and swallowed it due to how good it was. The boss can leave the room? She screeched as it just a tad. There was a silence before a new voice spoke. He can. Not often, as I, find training takes up too much of my time. Mother, encourage me to be social. The deep voice called and a wave of power crawled over Kemi's skin. This feeling, it pricked her very senses. Inside, a tiny voice screamed for her to run. Bosses had a unique energies, a deeper, more violent coursing pulse of a dungeon's power than anyone else. It was usually so unique that one could not mistake it for anything else. But the feeling hidden in now was not blood-soaked aura that she had expected. It was like steel, solid and polished. The feeling coming off the boss who took the stool next to her made her think of a knight. Solid and unwavering, his purpose and life dedicated to the kingdom that he lived in. Fran, the pig knight. Kemi felt more awed than afraid for a moment. Farah, I'd like a pop. Fran's deep voice called. Kemi was still until something large and wet pushed into her face. She yelped as the young reached out and gave her a curious taste. Sorry about him. Bacon doesn't meet new people often. Fran Orr's gentle tone made Kemi finally able to speak. B -b bacon my pig. I ride him into battle for glory. Bran's tone remained pleasant. Kemi nodded slowly. Truth was really stranger than fiction. She needed more pop. She heard the mug being refilled and winced at the fact that she would have to drink another one. Another delicious drink. The place hurt her head. Kemi kind of liked it. End of chapter. That, my friends, concludes this episode. I hope that you enjoyed. If you wish to support the author of the story, there will be a link to below. If you wish to support this channel, there are multiple ways to do so, which will all also be linked below. But the easiest way would be to subscribe and share my videos as much as possible. And until next time, I hope you all have a good one. And I'll see you all in the next video. Cheers.